Hello, I'm Christopher Richland from the University of Rochester Medical Center, and I have the pleasure today of discussing with you abstracts presented at the 2012 American College of Rheumatology meeting in Washington, D.C., that were centered on spondyloarthropathy. Uh, the first slide really reviews the ASAS classification criteria for spondyloarthritis. And these are new classification criteria that were meant to uh, include a way of diagnosis of spondyloarthropathy that went beyond the New York criteria, which is very much centered on x-rays. And the thinking behind this, in part, was that if we are able to identify patients with spondyloarthritis uh, who have both x-ray changes and no x-ray changes, this will increase the number of patients that we can diagnose and treat to uh, hopefully prevent damage and improve quality of life and function. So this slide is from the ASAS website and is a, a review of the criteria for both axial spondyl arthropathy on the left and peripheral spondyl arthropathy on the right. So I'm just going to walk you through these because this slide will serve as a reference for the studies that I'm about to describe in the next couple of slides. So in order to meet these criteria, you have to have three or more months of back pain and age of onset of less than 45 years. So uh, this is the stem for axial spinal arthropathy. And one can arrive at that diagnosis in these new criteria by one of two means. One is to have sacroiliitis on imaging, and this imaging can be plain X-ray or MRI, plus uh, one or more spondyloarthropathy features. Uh, and those features are listed below, and I'm not going to read through them. Uh, you are familiar with them, I'm sure. Now, another way that you can reach the diagnosis of axial spondyloarthropathy is by having HLA-B27 positivity plus two or more of these other spa features, again, listed below. Uh, and the sensitivity and specificity of these criteria are listed uh, below this on the left. Now, there are other patients, as you know, who have peripheral symptoms only, and they've been labeled peripheral spondyloarthropathy. So the stem here is that patients have arthritis or enthesitis or dactylitis plus one or more of the spondyloarthropathy features listed below. And again, I'm not going to read through these, or two or more of the other spondyloarthropathy features listed below that. Now, this can be very helpful in diagnosing peripheral spondyloarthropathy, but I have to say a couple of things. One is that psoriatic arthritis tends to be somewhat different than your peripheral spondyloarthropathy in the sense that these patients can be more rheumatoid-like, meaning that they uh, can have severe erosions uh, and they can have a very robust arthritis like mutilans that's not a type of joint problem that you see in a patient with axial back pain and peripheral involvement, which tends to be milder. So there's a, a debate that's ongoing as to whether psoriatic arthritis should be included under this term peripheral spondyloarthropathy, uh, but we'll leave more details uh, on this for a later time. So just please keep this in the back of your mind in terms of how we classify spinal arthropathy in these new criteria. And now I'm going to uh, go directly to some clinical studies that were presented uh, in the meeting in Washington uh, in November. So the first is the rapid axial spa. This is cetalizumab in this uh, uh, ASN axial spinal arthropathy. And this is the first randomized controlled trial of cetalizumab pegol and axial spinal arthropathy using the criteria I just went over. It's placebo-controlled at week 24, dose-blinded to week 48, and then open label um, to week 158. And you can see that it's randomized one to one to one, the placebo and the two doses of sertilizumab, given every uh, two weeks in a 200 milligram dose or four weeks in a 400 milligram dose after loading. And you can see the cl clinical outcomes on this slide at week 12, which was the primary outcome measure uh, uh, in this uh, time of the primary outcome measure in this study. So on the left graph shows the ASAS-20 uh, for the three groups of patients, the placebo in gray. Uh, and then you can see the ASAS partial remission, and please note the number of patients are listed below that. Now if you divide those up into whether they had an ankylosing spondylitis, 
And as you recall, ankylosing spondylitis is usually is by the New York criteria, so radiographic damage, you can see the response rates for both the ACES-20 and ACES partial remission. And then all the way to the right are the response in patients in the study who had non-radiographic axial spinal arthropathy. And what's really intriguing here is that the response to the non-radiographic is superimposable on uh, the patients that had met criteria for AS. Therefore, this study shows that in patients with axial spondyloarthropathy, whether they had ankylosing spondylitis according to the New York criteria or non-radiographic axial spondyloarthropathy according to the criteria I just presented, the responses were pretty much identical. I think this underscores the idea that using radiographs as a sole way of diagnosing AS falls short and will not allow us to treat a number of patients who don't have radiographic disease that could benefit uh, from therapy. The next study is the ABILITY-2. This is adalimumab in patients with peripheral spondyloarthritis. And so again, using the criteria I set out at the beginning of this presentation, peripheral SPA, 165 patients who met these criteria uh, without significant back pain were randomized to adalimumab 40 milligrams every other week or placebo for 12 weeks. And in this study, they used a new outcome measure, which is the peripheral SPA response criteria, or the PSPARC-40. Not yet validated, uh, but certainly this is one of the first steps toward that validation uh, procedure. So here you see these patients meeting the peripheral spinal arthropathy criteria, and they uh, had either one or more SPA features, but they could not have psoriasis. So patients with psoriatic arthritis were not included in this study. And then you can see the other way they could reach the diagnosis was by having two or more other SPA features. Uh, and in this case, if you glance to the right, uh, it shows the primary endpoint at 12 weeks, which was the PSPARC-40. And you can see here that there's a significant greater number of patients who achieve this endpoint at 12 weeks in the adalimumab versus the placebo groups. So this study confirms uh, that adalimumab is effective in peripheral spondyloarthropathy patients who do not have accompanying psoriasis. And uh, we'll have to see how the PSPARC measure works out as a uh, outcome instrument uh, in trials moving forward, but this is very encouraging. In the next slide, uh, we're looking at the ability to study that you just saw and, and trying to determine if uh, patients uh, that have oligoarticular disease or women uh, have less severe disease uh, in this group. And the way this was analyzed is uh, and the table on the left. You can see here the oligoarticular patients, 34 of them versus the polyarticular. Uh, the oligoarticular had three tender and two swollen joints compared to the polyarticular, which you see to the right. And what's really fascinating is that these groups really were not different in terms of duration of disease, HLA-B27 positivity, uh, or their activity as determined by the BASDI or the uh, patient global assessment. And the table to the right breaks it down according to male and female. And once again, the oligoarticular uh, was not different than the polyarticular uh, according to gender in terms of duration disease, HLA-B27, uh, the uh, level of the number of patients who had high sensitivity CRP abnormalities, uh, or in the uh, patient-reported uh, uh, instruments. So these data suggest that in non-PSA peripheral SPA patients, those who were in ability to that disease activity was similar regardless of gender or whether the disease was oligoarticular or polyarticular. This is very important because there has been this sense that people with oligoarticular disease uh, were less likely to have uh, severe problems and less likely to need more aggressive treatment. And at least in this particular subgroup, that does not appear to be the case. This is the Sentinel study, the next slide, which is the prevalence of SPA in anterior uveitis patients. This is a prospective multi-center non-comparative cohort study in which patients uh, were, uh, had to have clinically significant anterior uveitis as defined by recurrent anterior uveitis, two or more episodes separated by three months, 
or non-recurrent HLA B27 associated uveitis. And the ACES criteria were used to diagnose spinal arthropathy, and we've gone through those. And they had 231 patients from 30 referral centers, including those um, uh, existing disease. And what's really, uh, I think, informative here is that of those patients with anterior uveitis, 65% of those uh, had an associated underlying spondyl arthritis. So on the graph to the right, uh, one can see the bar graph. You can see that 36% did not have a spondyl arthropathy. About 50% had axial and 15% peripheral spa. So these data really tell us that ophthalmologists need to be aware that in their patients that come in with anterior uveitis, that more than half, uh, almost the two-thirds of those patients uh, will likely have an accompanying axial or peripheral spinal arthropathy, and they need to be thinking about some critical questions or referral to a rheumatologist uh, to help make that diagnosis. Now, one of the uh, questions that's really been at the forefront of the biology of ankylosing spondylitis is whether or not this is a disease that is autoimmune or whether it's primarily of innate immunity. Uh, and one of the problems that uh, we have in trying to think about it being an autoimmune disease is we've not been able to identify an autoantigen. And secondly, it's associated with HLA-B27, which is a class one MHC molecule, um, which is different than the types of autoimmune diseases we see in practice, such as rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, uh, which are classically class two MHC molecules. Nonetheless, in this study, the authors looked at the presence of antibodies to CLIP, which is class two associated invariant chain peptide. And the cartoon here explains this molecule in terms of its function. So you see uh, in the endoplasmic reticulum to the left, there's a class two MHC molecule. And I have to say uh, that this looks like an antibody. I apologize for that, it should not. This is a class two MHC, which you know has that sort of hot dog bun appearance in crystallography. And associated with that class two MHC molecule is the clip peptide, which you can see is bound to it uh, with a little ball and then that long uh, peptide chain representation. And so uh, this stays with the class two MHC molecule in the endoplasmic reticulum, but then undergoes, as you cast your eyes to the right, proteolytic degradation. And you can see that it's degraded and the clip is released from the MHC molecule so that the peptide antigen shown in blue can be inserted into the arms of that MHC class one molecule, which then of course uh, then goes to the cell surface and presents the antigen uh, to the awaiting T cell. So these authors asked whether or not patients with ankylosing spondylitis have an increased frequency of antibodies to CLIP. And they developed an ELISA, and indeed they showed that 85% of 94 axial spinal arthropathy patients had these autoantibodies, but only 8% of the 51 controls. Moreover, higher levels of anti-CLIMP antibodies were noted in the axial spinal arthritis versus the non uh, spinal arthritis with um, a very significant difference in these levels as shown, 14.5 uh, versus 0 0.08 absorbance units. So these are fascinating in the sense that we have not talked about or seen autoantibodies associated with ankylosing spondylitis. Obviously, confirmatory studies are needed, but this is an area I think we should be watching closely, not only from a diagnostic point of view, but also in helping us think about uh, novel pathogenic pathways. In the next slide, uh, this was a biomarker that was examined in ankylosing spondylitis, uh, and we have precious little in the way of biomarkers to help us with trying to determine which patients are more likely to progress. The factors we tend to look at are baseline syndesmophytes uh, and elevated C-reactive protein uh, as measures that may indicate patients who are likely to develop bony syndesmophytes. But in this study, they looked at VEGF levels, uh, and they used, uh, again, ELISA looking at the serum levels, and they took two groups of patients. Uh, one group of AS patients who had no uh, a low presence of 
syndesmophytes at baseline and those that had um, syndesmophytes, and they showed that the baseline uh, VEGF level was significantly higher in the progressors versus the non-progressors, and that uh, an elevated VEGF at baseline had a positive predictive value of 56% and a negative predictive value of 92% for progression. So from a clinical perspective, if your VEGF level was not elevated at baseline, it was highly likely that you were not going to progress uh, over uh, two years. Now, you can see the ROC curve on the right, and uh, it shows the sensitivity and specificity of VEGF and the cutoff at 494. So this, again, is very exciting as a predictive biomarker of progression, but uh, we will need uh, confirmatory studies to determine whether or not uh, this is a valid and reliable biomarker for this purpose. This concludes uh, my presentation on abstracts presented at the 2012 ACR meeting in Washington, D.C. in the area of spondyloarthritis, and I hope you found this session uh, helpful. Have a good day.